I have a quote for you. Quote, Matrimony is always a vice. All that can be done is to excuse it and to sanctify it. End quote. A fella by the name of Jerome said that. He is one of the, quote, fathers, end quote, of the Catholic Church. That was his opinion about the subject of marriage. Matrimony is always a vice. All that can be done is to excuse it and to sanctify it. That's what Jerome thought. I have another quote for you. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife. Now God said that. That was God's opinion. Jerome had his opinion and God had his. Marriage is, a, is something that uh, you can find all kinds of books on. You can find you can find statements. You can find books that praise marriage. You can find you can find uh, statements that condemn it. Marriage has been called all kinds of things. Marriage has been under assault. Marriage has been a lot of things. Marriage has continued. Now, marriage as an institution, is increasingly being called into question today. We have what are called alternate lifestyles. Marriage is viewed by many as a human institution that must adapt to new standards of society. This is the way, of course, that many view it, and I'm afraid that even some, sometimes in God's church, have kind of lost sight of the true answers to some of these questions. But this is the way that many people view marriage. Well, you know, it, it, it has to adapt to the changing standards, the changing mores of the society. Divorce is more and more being viewed in society as a whole as a viable option. Now, I think you can realize, and any of you, if you'll think back, recognize the complete change in concept that has taken place in our society in recent years regarding the subject of marriage and divorce, for instance. Back in 1964, when Nelson Rockefeller and Barry Goldwater were contesting each other for the Republican presidential nomination, Nelson Rockefeller lost the Republican nomination because he lost the crucial California primary. And those of you who remember that and who were following it at the time, Remember that it was considered by political analysts and commentators at that time that the most significant factor in Rockefeller's losing the California primary was his divorce and remarriage that had taken place a year or so prior. Well, you know, that's, that's a matter of public record. You, you don't remember it, go back and, uh, to the library and do a little research and look back in the, in the newspapers and the magazine articles of the time. Now, we are at a time period, 15 years after that, where, you know, Jerry Brown goes to California on a, uh, oh, let's see, what did they, uh, oh, what did the newspaper call it? Uh, uh, in, uh, he and Linda Ronstadt in unwedded bliss. That's the way the, uh, uh, you know, honeymoon is often referred to as wedded bliss. Well, the newspaper uh, put it in, in uh, quotation marks and referred to uh, Jerry Brown and Linda Ronstadt uh, as being an unwedded bliss as they toured Africa. Well, uh, for those who are naive among you, you don't have to read very far uh, below, between the lines to figure out uh, that they were doing more than just going over to, uh, you know, see the giraffes or something. Uh, they had, uh, you know, anyway. The point is, though, it never came up. It never came up. That, that perhaps this would be damaging to his presidential aspiration. You know, he was kind of, uh, you've heard of a trial marriage. He was having kind of a trial political marriage. He got tangled up in politics over there, and I think he wound up being a little bit missed because of the attention he was spending on politics. But the point is that society standards have changed. You know, society standards have changed. Can you imagine a fellow running for president doing something like that 15 years ago? I'm not saying 15 years ago we had perfect standards. I'm just saying that it's been continuing on a downhill to bond in front. And if 15 years ago, a divorce cost Nelson Rockefeller uh, the presidential nomination. 
or very very likely did, was a, was a major factor in it. You know, a king of England, Edward VIII, back in the 1930s, what, 1937, had to abdicate his throne because he chose to marry a, a divorced woman. And there was such a public outcry over this. Now, this, this gives you an idea in terms of, of a standard that society has, has completely done an about face in because... Um, Divorce is, is considered a very viable option. One out, uh, in excess of one out of every three marriages end in divorce now. And the divorce rate is rapidly rising. It's rising among middle-aged couples. It's rising in areas of society where it was uh, uh, virtually non-existent before. Now this is happening in society as a whole. And brethren, many of the attitudes of society affect those of us in God's church. Too many just because we're in God's church, we don't live in a vacuum tube and kind of are, are, are uh, insulated and protected and shot through this society into the kingdom without having to contend with the influences, the pressures, uh, all of the things that are a part of this society. And many of the attitudes of the society around us tend to rub off on us. And there have been many in God's church that have been uh, that have been affected by some of these attitudes. And it, it certainly has caused problems. Uh, there have even been uh, such things as, as actual divorce and remarriage inside the church uh, by individuals who are ostensibly members of the church, and some of these things are going to be uh, dealt with and rectified in, in the not too distant future. But the point is that there have been There has been not only a changing attitude in society, not only have more and more marriages been ending in divorce, but many of the marriages that don't end in divorce are simply hollow, empty shells of a marriage, and certainly not what God intended marriage to be. So on the one hand, you have something that ends in divorce, which is not good. On the other hand, you've got many, many more that are just hollow shells. They are not what God intended for man to hang. I think it's very important that we understand some of the living laws that God has set in motion which can produce and do produce a truly happy marriage. Because it is important to, to have a perspective on this and to understand the importance of it. And to underline the importance of it, I think we need to go back. <clears throat> we need to go back to Matthew chapter 19 and to understand to begin with the sanctity of marriage, the permanence of marriage, the fact that marriage is a divine institution. It is a natural union, but it is a divine institution. Man did not invent marriage. God did. Now, in Matthew chapter 19, let's pick it up in verse 1. <clears throat> and it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these things, he departed from Galilee and came into the coast of Judea beyond Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them. And the Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him. This was their attitude. They came in, a, in an attitude of trying to tempt him, trying to trip him up, trying to trap him. And saying unto him, here was their, their question, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Now, Let's stop here and let's understand a little bit of what the Pharisees meant when they asked that question. When they said, is it lawful, they had reference to the law. Now, the first five books of the Bible were called and are called by the Jews the law or the Torah. The first five books, the books of Moses. When they said, is it lawful, they had reference. They had reference particularly to Deuteronomy chapter 24. I'm not going to go back through there. The, the subject of the sermon is not divorce and remarriage and going into all the details of that. Uh, perhaps I will give a sermon on that in, in, in the, uh, you know, the not too distant future. I, I don't know. I don't have anything specifically planned on it. But uh, that, I don't want to get just off into that and all the technicalities of that uh, because that, that's not what I want to focus on this afternoon. But it is important to set a stage. Now, this is what they had reference to, to, to Deuteronomy 24, where the Jews and the Israelites, or, or Moses had given to the Israelites,
Israelite a legal stipulation concerning the subject of divorce. And he said, if a man discover some uncleanness or the marginal rendering is some matter of nakedness in his wife, and he can he can uh, put her away and it goes through. Now, it's worded in the Hebrew. You can check it out. It, it's very ambiguous. It's very, some people think, you know, if they just knew the Hebrew, that they would understand all the details and all the technicalities in the Bible. Well, I want to tell you, the nation of Greece is filled with people who speak Greek. And I don't know very many of them that understand the New Testament. I don't know if there are any of them that do. You know, the nation of Israel is filled with Jews who speak Hebrew. And the Jews read the Old Testament in Hebrew. Many of them do. The Orthodox do. Certainly the rabbis do. And they don't understand what it says. So just because you understand the Greek and the Hebrew doesn't mean you're going to understand the Bible. See, the Pharisees understood Hebrew. That they, they read Hebrew. They, they spoke it. And probably understood it better than any of the scholars do today because it was more of a living language at that time. Now, they had many, many different schools of thought among themselves. There were the, the liberals and the conservatives and all the various schools of thought in between. Some of them took a very loose interpretation of Deuteronomy 24 uh, to the point that, you know, she burns the toast, put her away. Uh, trade her in on a new model, kind of like some people do cars, you know, trade in on a new model every year. They had a very loose, broad interpretation in any cause would do. Others took a, uh, took a stricter stance, uh, but there were various gradations of them. And what they wanted to do, they liked, the, the Pharisees liked to haggle. They liked to argue about the law. And they wanted to get Jesus Christ tripped up into one of their technical arguments. And they had, they had several of them on this subject. So they asked him, they said, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Well, can, will, will any cause do? Referring back to Deuteronomy 24, which is somewhat ambiguous in the original. All right. He answered them and said unto them, Have you not read? They have to understand a little bit about the Pharisees to realize this was the ultimate and a put down. They prided themselves on not only having read, but having virtually memorized the whole Old Testament. got a scriptural vocabulary you're proud of, you know, you know, a hundred, uh, a hundred scriptures or something. I dare say that uh, there are not very many of us that, that would be in that classification, but if you do, you're still far short of them. They had, they had tremendous sections of the Bible memorized. They really prided themselves on this. It was a real point of vanity with them. All right. So Christ gave them the ultimate in a put down, and this is the way he answered them many times. He would say, well, haven't you read? And, and this, you know, everybody's standing around and they, they kind of snicker because that, that was really, that hit them where it hurt. It hit them right in the vanity. You know, that, that's where it hurt. He said, have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more twain but one flesh, what therefore God is going together, let not man put asunder. Now, they said, is it awful? Christ answered out of the law. But he went back, prior to Deuteronomy, he went back to the book of Genesis. He went back, he's quoting from Genesis chapter 2. Genesis, uh, or Genesis chapter 1. Uh, the end of, the end of Genesis chapter 1. He quoted from the law. Now, Jesus Christ knew what Deuteronomy 24 meant. He's the one that inspired Moses to write it down. See, he could have told them what the original meant and explained the whole thing to them in detail. But this tells us a little bit, and I think it's important to focus in on this. This tells us how Jesus Christ dealt with questions like this. And a lot of times people come up with a question, and they really want to strive about words. They want to argue about some technicality because they have in mind what they want to do, and they've got their way, and that's what they want. And they want to strive about some technicality so that they can justify themselves. Jesus Christ refused to strive about technicality. Jesus Christ pointed them back to the basic principle. 
See, he didn't, he, he could have gone into Deuteronomy 24 and explained it in detail if he wanted to do it that way, but he didn't. He, in effect, said to the Hort fellows, if you're really interested in doing what God wants you to do, let's go back here and see what God said. Let's see what God's will is. Let's understand the plan, the purpose, the will of God. And if we understand that, we understand what God wants us to do, that ought to take care of us. You know, provided you fellows want to do what God says. I mean, this is in effect what he told them. He pointed them back to the basic principle. In effect, he said, look, if you want to know, you're really curious to find out how many wives God thought a man ought to have. How many did he make for Adam? Gives you a little insight into the subject. You see, that's, that's the way Christ answers. He did not strive about a lot of technicalities. He pointed them back to a basic principle. He said, in the beginning, what did God do? He made one man and one woman. And he joined them together in marriage and said, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother, cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one. So God joined them together. What God joined together, let not man put asunder. He dealt with it in principle. Now, this really shot him out of the saddle. In verse 7, they said unto him, you know, they, then they were upset. They really had their feathers ruffled because he hadn't answered them the way they, the way they had posed. They thought they were going to get an argument going. And Jesus Christ dealt with them on the matter of the basic principles of the law of God. They said, well, why did Moses then command to give a right of a, a writing of divorcement and put it away? Now, notice the way they phrased it. They said, well, Moses told us we had to, we, we had to divorce and, and give this writing of divorcement and put them away. No, Moses didn't tell them they had to divorce anything. Notice what he said. Verse 8, he said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, allow. There's a lot of difference between allowing and commanding. You know, so, so let's notice to begin with. Why, Moses didn't command them to give a writing of divorcement and put them away. So they, they tried to, Lay, lay it off and say, well, you know, you're condemning us to Moses. He said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, because you guys are so carnal minded, because you're not led by the Spirit of God, Moses allowed you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. You know, God did not mention anything to Adam and Eve on the subject of divorce. You know, God gave them instruction in the Garden of Eden. He didn't, he didn't give them any instructions concerning divorce. Didn't mention it in the first marriage ceremony because God never intended it. Didn't intend for Adam and Eve to divorce. He said Moses allowed something because you were not, you were carnal minded. Your hearts were hard. You were not led by the Spirit of God. So Moses allowed it. But that was never God's intention from the beginning. So he really put it back on them in showing them the basic principle. And then he went on to give Verse 9, the statement, I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be. For fornication, as it reads in, in, in the English, the Greek word is porneia, and it means gross immorality. It goes beyond, it does not just simply mean adultery. It does not mean uh, just adultery, because, just go on, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for porneia, and shall marry another, commit, Adultery. Now, the word that's translated adultery here is the Greek word moikia. Not porneia, but moikia. A completely different word that means adultery. Porneia means something different. It goes beyond adultery. It, it carries the connotation of harlotry. A quarter. Uh, as you go back to Jeremiah, I believe in chapter 3, where God talked about he was going to put away Israel because of Israel playing the harlot. You know, just a, a repetitive thing. And when the Old Testament was translated into Greek in the, uh, in, in the Septuagint, uh, the word porneo was used there to translate that word harlot, or whoredom, in, in the Old Testament. So, he says, except whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for porneo, to marry another commits adultery, and whosoever marries her that is put away does commit adultery. And his disciples said unto him, if, if the case of a man be so with his wife, it's good not to marry. You know, he says, boy, you know, you better be careful. You might get hooked and then you can't get out of it. That's what they said to him later. So they said, oh, boy, you know, that sounds rough. What he told them was far stricter than anything the Jews said. You see, any of the 
the schools of thought of the Jews. And so it struck some of the disciples, boy, you know, maybe I just won't get married at all. I, I get stuck with one that I can't get rid of. And Christ said, all men cannot receive this thing except those to whom it is given. There are some eunuchs that are so born from their mother's womb. There are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men. And there are eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven. Say, well, you know, you fellow kings don't feel like you can marry and, and live with this standard. Maybe you just better be a eunuch for the kingdom's sake. Maybe you just better not get married then. Well, that's what he told them. I think we need to understand that and, and, and to realize this was the, this was the uh, you know this was the criteria that Christ gave. Now, uh, I realize that there are amplifications of that in First Corinthians seven. There are things that connect with with uh, unconverted people and things that people did prior to their knowledge of the truth. You know, just as God allowed the Israelites to do certain things because of the hardness of their hearts, because they were unconverted. Uh, so God, you know, the whole world is unconverted. And because of the hardness of their hearts, God uh, is not judging the world in a spiritual sense right now. But when it comes down to the standard that God requires of converted people inside, I don't want to get off uh, into a lot of the details and all of the, the technicalities of it. I want to deal with the principle because I want us to understand that marriage is an institution ordained of God to be a permanent relationship between one man and one woman until death do them part. And that is the will of God. That is the statement of God. That is the teaching of Jesus Christ. You know, God says back in the book of Malachi. Malachi chapter 2, verse 14. Yet you say... Uh, see, God is going through here. He's talking about, in verse 11, Judah has dealt treacherously and an abomination is committed in Israel. And uh, Judah has profaned the holiness of the eternal. And so it goes on that God will cut him off. And in, in verse 14, yet you say, wherefore? Why? You know, they, 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 they kind of clasped their hands and were very pious and said, oh, why would God talk to us that way? Because the eternal has been witness between you and the wife of your youth. Notice what God focuses on as he's talking to the people. Because the eternal has been witness between you and the wife of your youth. You know, in, the, in marriage ceremonies, a covenant with God. You know, we enter in, we, we, we make a vow. You know, as it says in the scripture, we even sing it in one of the, song, one of the songs we sing. Pay all your vows to God most high. You know, God becomes a party to the situation when, when we, uh, every marriage that I've ever performed, you know, at the end of that marriage, I've laid hands on that couple and have asked God to unite them and to bind them. All right, God says, uh, the eternal has been witness between you and the wife of your youth against whom you have dealt treacherously. Yet is she your companion and the wife of your covenant. You know, you made a vow, you made a covenant. Did not he make one? You know, didn't God make one? Yet, now this is added in. It's kind of ambiguous in the King James. I'll read it and then I'll paraphrase it for you. Yet had he the residue of the Spirit and wherefore one? Now what's, um, that he might seek a godly seed. Now let's, let's understand. Did not he, God, make one? Yet he, the man, was high-spirited and said, why one? You know, that's, that's what it said. Uh, that, that's the, you can check it uh, in the Amplified and in other verses. This is what it's talking about. Uh, he had, uh, you know, he, he was high-spirited. He said, well, you know, I, I just, uh, uh, I, I can't, uh, can't control myself. Uh, why one? The answer, that he might seek a godly seed. You know, why did God do it that way? To preserve, to establish and preserve a godly family relationship with children brought up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. That's why, that's why God established it that way, that he might seek a godly seed. Therefore, take heed to your spirit. You know, you better control yourself. That's what God's saying. You better control yourself and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. Or, as the margin renders it, deal unfaithfully against the wife of your youth. For the eternal, the God of Israel says that he hates putting away. You know, God hates divorce. That's what it says right here. Malachi 2.16, if you want to reference on that. That he hates putting away. One covers violence with his garments, says the eternal of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit. Control yourself that you deal not treacherously. 
You have wearied the eternal with your word. God says, I'm tired of hearing what you say. As he speaks here, Malachi speaks to the Jews. Yet you say, wherein have we wearied him? When you say, everyone that does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or where is the God of judgment? You know, he said, oh, well, that's okay. God will understand. God says, I, I'm sick and tired of hearing that kind of thing. Well, that, that's what God says on the subject. This, this is, this, this is to give us an overview to understand that God established marriage. It goes back to the beginning of creation. God established it as a permanent institution. God established it to bind one man and one woman, uh, together in marriage union until death is in part. That's God's intention from the beginning on the subject of marriage. So, when we approach marriage from that standpoint, we approach it from a completely different standpoint than society as a whole uh, deals with the subject of marriage today. Marriage pictures the relationship of Christ and the church. You know, to begin with, marriage is a divine institution ordained of God to be permanent. Marriage pictures the relationship of Christ and the church. Now, let's understand some things about the basis of marriage. One of the most basic things that serves as a basis of marriage or a very uh, something that is to be a part of marriage is intimacy. And this includes a variety of things. Genesis chapter 1 verse 20. No, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 20. Adam gave names to all the cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field, but for Adam there was not found a help meet for him. There was no suitable companion for Adam to share his life with. The eternal God caused deep sleep to fall on Adam and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh and said thereof. And you don't notice that God gave Adam a chance to first realize that he was alone. He was by himself. He had no one to share his life with. God gave Adam a chance to first recognize the fact that none of the animals were a suitable companion for him. Adam recognized that, that he had no one to share paradise with. So then God caused this sleep to fall on Adam, and he took out one of his ribs. He took out a part of Adam to make that a part of the woman so that the woman and the man would, would be you know, bound in that unique sense that they were not entirely separately created. You know, God could have created Eve out of the dust of the ground, just like he did Adam. But he made Eve literally a part of Adam. Because that's, that's what God intended. And verse 22, the rib which the eternal God had taken from man made he a woman, and he brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now, the statement made in verse 24, that uh, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Adam didn't say that. If you just read it in Genesis 2, you would know who said it. Jesus Christ said in Matthew 19, God said, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother. Jesus Christ was there. He's the one that actually said it. He, he knew. So we know that this was actually a part of the a divine marriage ceremony. You know, God brought Adam and Eve together. God brought Eve to Adam, presented her to Adam. God instructed Adam and Eve about marriage. God told them about it. God performed the first marriage ceremony. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. They were in an intimate, close relationship with one another. Now, intimacy goes beyond physical intimacy and, and goes on to include the mental, the emotional, the spiritual closeness. God says that the man and the woman are to become one, to be one place, to grow together in a close, intimate relationship that covers all aspects. Well, that's, 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 the, that's the ideal. That's what God intends. And certainly, we're both mates or in God's church and understand the truth of the Bible. Now, this is exactly what should be. You know, in some cases, maybe only one is trying to uh, 
you know, only one is consulting the instruction books, and sometimes they're problems. But uh, sometimes they're problems uh, regardless. But they're problems that shouldn't be there when we both go back and we're instructed in God's Word and we apply what we read. It doesn't do any good to have the instruction book if you don't use it. So the, the, the fact is, though, that we have access. Society is in a quandary. They don't know the answer. We have the answers available to us. Now, whether we apply them or not is, is the question. But God intended a close, intimate relationship between husband and wife. That's the way God, in, that's the way God designed it. And of course, uh, as human beings, uh, there, there's the physical side, and there's also the mental, the emotional, and the spiritual. And there needs to be that type of compatibility, that, that type of oneness as that grows and develops between a husband and wife. That's why, uh, you know, it's so important. And that's why God gives instruction about not being unequally yoked together. Why uh, a Christian is forbidden to, to marry one who is not a Christian, who is not converted, uh, according to the word of God. Because uh, in, in a situation like that, there can never be the, the intimate bonding that God intends. And so, you know, those who are in that situation, when they're called into the church, uh, have to make the best of it. Those who are already in the church, you know, they have the absolute height of folly to go out and seek something uh, that is going to simply uh, lead to more problems and compound problems. You know, that's why God forbids us uh, that we do that. So, we see that intimacy is a basis of marriage, and going on, something that is a basis for intimacy uh, is love. Now, God defines love, and God tells us how we're to love each other, and God tells husbands and wives how they're to love each other. Back in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25, it says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. I want to tell you something, husbands, that's a tall order. Let me read that again. Husbands, love your wives. How much should you love even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Christ gave himself for his bride. Jesus Christ sacrificed himself for his bride. You talk about, you see, love is not selfish. I want to go through some things in 1 Corinthians 13. I want to focus on it in, in the context of marriage. The love Jesus Christ had for the church was not a selfish kind of a love. To where, you know, love consists of, well, I want you to do all these things for me, you know, and I'll sit here and enjoy it. Love is an outgoing concern, and that was the way Jesus Christ expressed his love to the church. On down in verse 28, so ought men to love their wives as their own body. He that loves his wife loves himself. You know, God joins you together as one. You ought to love your wife as, as you love your, your own body, your own self. You know, take care of her and even go beyond that to uh, give yourself for her, to sacrifice yourself for her. Uh, that, that doesn't mean just some, uh, well, you know, I, if it ever came down to it, boy, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd sure protect her. I, I'd sure, you know, I, I'd jump, I, I'd jump in the middle. I, I'd, uh, I'd be there to rescue her, to play the dashing hero. All the while, we, we sit around and we, we never do anything that uh, is geared toward serving and helping uh, our wife. No, you know, if we're going to give ourselves, you s sacrifice yourself. Uh, what, what is your, you know, you sacrifice your life, what is your life? Your life is composed of time. Your life is composed of time. Well, one of the problems in our society, and, and I, I uh, in fact, a little earlier in, in, in uh, Ephesians 5.16, it talks about redeeming the time because the days, are, the days are evil. I'm going to tell you, if they had to worry about redeeming the time because the days were evil back then, how much more do we have to worry about it today? We live in such a hectic, fast-paced society. And so many times, husbands, you know, real easy to get caught up in work and caught up in all kinds of outside interests. And to neglect. The giving of ourselves to our wives in the way that God intended, the way that God commanded. So we're told to love our wives in the same way Christ loved the church. Now, love has to provide a basis for intimacy, which is, you know, an important uh, basis of marriage. God says in, in Ephesians 5.22, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. 
You know, why adapt yourself? Submit means to, to adapt, to fit in with. Nothing could have two, two heads, two bosses. Why submit yourselves, adapt yourselves to your husband? You know, try to fit in with their plan. That's what it says. As under the Lord. Going on down, uh, verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Now going on down to verse 33. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. You know, husband, show love, respect, tenderness to your wife. Wives, show respect, show admiration, uh, show the, the proper regard to your husband. That's what he's saying here. He focuses in on, on fortunes that, that both are to supply, on things that they're to do. You, uh, you gain. The, or you, you, uh, you show love by, by carrying out your responsibilities, by doing as God says. Back in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, let's notice briefly some things that God has to say concerning love what love is and understand how it applies to the subject of marriage. He defines love in verse 4, beginning in verse 4 of 1 Corinthians 13. Love suffers all. In other words, love is slow to lose patience. Love doesn't say, well, you know, just first, second time. You know, uh, you're you're out. You know, uh, that that's once, that's twice. Boy, you're you're in trouble. Love is slow to lose patience and is kind. In other words, it strives to be constructive. Love is not belittling. Love does not chip away. Love does not make sarcastic comments. Love doesn't try to cut someone down. To, uh, in the sermonette. Mr. Strain talking, was talking about words and, and, and was talking about uh, controlling your tongue and the things you say. You know, love is kind. Love does not make belittling comments. Love envies not or is not possessive. Love vaunts not itself, is not puffed up. In other words, love is neither anxious to impress others nor does it have an inflated idea of itself. Love does not behave itself unseemly, or put another way, love has good manners. Love says please and thank you. So how many times, I'll tell you, brethren, one of the reasons that there's so many problems, one of the reasons for so many problems in marriage, is there are a number of reasons. Well, one thing that gets back to a lot of it is the fact that after people are married for a while, they very quickly began to take each other for granted. And the little niceties, the, the courtesies, the, the kindness, the, the politeness, the good manners began to go by the wayside. You know, holding the door open for your wife, well, well, you can hold it open for herself. She's tall enough. Now, you didn't think that way. You didn't think that way when you were dating her. You didn't think that way, you know, uh, the night you proposed uh, to her and ask her to marry you. Ah, hold it open yourself. You know, as strong as I am, you can hold it open. You know, love has good manners. I'll tell you something. Little things mean a lot. And especially, little things mean a lot to women. You men want a hint? You know, try paying attention to little things. Now, a lot of little things make up some big things. You know, be, be courteous. Be polite. Please and thank you can go a long way. Problems in families so often come up because we, we become overly familiar with each other and we take each other for granted. And we, 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 we kind of take the approach, well, you know, I know I don't say it anymore, but, but, you know, she knows. You sure? No one likes to be taken for granted. You know, you don't. You do a job, and the boss comes up, and he commends you on it. He says, boy, you know, I, I really appreciate what you did on that. Or if he asks you to do something, and he asks you in a nice way, 
you certainly feel a lot better about doing it. Now, you might do it if you just came up and said, go do it. But you'd, you, you would like it a lot more, and, and, and it would help your relationship. You said, look, you know, I, I'd like for you to do this over here and, and, and express it in a nice and a, and a polite way. All right, love has good manners. Love seeks not her own. Or, in other words, love does not pursue selfish advantage. I'm just concerned about me and what I can get for me. Love does not pursue selfish advantage. You know, it's kind of like the, the guy who's, who's weighing the alternatives. He's got, you know, got some money. He's got to decide what to uh, buy with it. Uh, he could, on the one hand, buy uh, buy a washing machine for his wife because, you know, they got uh, seven kids and, uh, you know, she's still using the scrub board or something. And he could buy a washing machine for her or he could buy that new gun he's been wanting to get. You know, and he thinks about it and he says, well, you know, I'm the head of the house and i got to make that decision. And boy, I sure like to hunt. Uh, you know, and away he goes. No, that, that's not showing love. You know, maybe, uh, okay, you know, he does that. But I'm going to tell you something. Any responsibility you have, don't think uh, that you're home free. You know, you can just make your decisions and you're not accountable to anyone. Let me tell you something, brethren. You know, judgment is right now on the house of God. Do you realize the responsibility that you have? You are, as husbands, responsible to God for the way you rule your family? Maybe you can, you know, do have the authority to go ahead and make certain decisions, but I'm going to tell you something. God is ultimately going to hold you accountable for the way you rule your family. And the way you, you know, have rule over your wife and over your children. God is ultimately going to bring you and me into judgment for that, and among other things he's going to bring us into judgment for. Now, judgment can be either good or bad. You know, judgment can be well done, you good and faithful servant. Or judge, judgment can be, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. The judgment is not necessarily bad. But just don't think that because God gives you the responsibility and you're, you know, the head of the house, that you're not responsible to anyone for your decisions. Oh, yes, you are. God is going to hold you responsible. If you misuse the authority that God has given you, God is going to bring you into judgment for it. I think we need to, you know, maybe realize that. and uh, Perhaps that can make a difference in the way we exercise that authority sometimes. So love does not seek selfish advantage. Love is, is not that way. Love is not easily provoked. You know, love does not have a hot temper ready to fly off the handle. Love thinks no evil, or love does not keep account of evil. How many times the problems come up, and all of a sudden, you know, big, big fight going on, and, and well, you did so-and-so, and last week you did that, and the week before, you know, and the whole long laundry list of things. Love does not keep account of evil. If you haven't read Mr. Partian's article in the New Good News uh, on uh, on forgiveness, you better read it. You better read it. He, he brings it out very forcefully in there about forgiving and forgetting. You know, I'll, I'll make that an assignment. You know, you, you do that. You read that article. I hope you're reading and studying all the good news that are coming out in the plain truth. Uh, I know sometimes maybe some of us got out of the habit or some got out of the habit of that in recent years. Uh, I think we really need to get back into it because there have been some tremendous articles coming out and things you need, things I need, things we all need. But that's a, a very important article on the subject of forgiveness. Love does not keep account of evil. doesn't keep a long list ready to pull it out and, you know, here's all the things you've ever done. And I'm going to add this one on to the bottom. And then I'll have... You know, and then, and then when you get to 491, well, then I can leave him. You know, says so you have to forgive him 70 times 7. I've got my list here. I'm just waiting until I hit 491, and there she goes. Well, that's not what Christ is talking about. You know, no, that's not the way to do it. Won't work that way. You might as well, you just, you have to just wad the list up and throw it away. So, uh, there goes that down the drain. Love rejoices not in iniquity, and it doesn't gloat over the wickedness of others, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. And goes on talking about other things. But we have a description here of love. 
and certainly a description we need to apply in our own lives, and certainly in our own marriage. I think one of the reasons why we're, why there's so many problems in home life, and why there's such an upsurge in divorce in our society, was headed, uh, was really analyzed well by U.S. News and World Report in a magazine article they had uh, about a year ago. And the title of the article is Why It's Called the Me Generation. Why It's Called the Me Generation. This is, uh, well, I'll read you the subtitle. For many young people, the pursuit of happiness is the dominant preoccupation. For some, it means self-indulgence. For others, the goal is self-understanding. Social analysts use the phrase, the new narcissism, narcissism, the new narcissism, to describe these goings on. Narcissists, they explain, find it difficult to enter into close relationships. A narcissist sees others existing only as a means for maintaining his or her own well-being. Now, let, let me explain a little bit here the, the, the term uh, narcissist or narcissist goes back to uh, in Greek mythology a fellow by the name of Narcissus. And the story of Narcissus is is that he, he sat gazing into a pool at his own reflection and fell in love with himself. You know, that's the story of Narcissus. It's, it's, uh, uh, you know, he he, he uh, fell in love with himself with his reflection in the pool and he spent all his time gazing at himself. You know, he was wild about uh, you know, he was the original me generation, okay? Well, his name has been given to psychiatrists and psychologists like to hang a label on everything. And so people that are excessively preoccupied with the self, with themselves, are called uh, narcissists. You know, that's called narcissism. narcissism. Anyway, call it pre- excessive preoccupation with the self. That's, it. That, that, that's more uh, explanative as to what it means. I wouldn't have gotten tongue-tied on that if I hadn't been. My wife and I were discussing how to pronounce it on the way to church in Lufkin this morning. We got to going back and forth trying to figure out on several alternate pronunciations. And uh, before we'd gotten very far, we started laughing. She said, you're, you're, probably going to, you're probably going to come out on one of those others when you get up there. Sure enough, I did. So I'm going <laughs> to... That's the way it works. Anyway. The point is, though, that... that our society is, is a society that is preoccupied with self. Some experts fear that this trend will lead America into an age of anarchic individualism that could have devastating impact on a society whose or- orderly functions depends to a large degree on self-restraint. Going on, uh, other parts of the article, even among couples who choose to have children, there is a change in values. A study by a New York research firm found that large numbers of parents are self-oriented and are reluctant to make sacrifices for their youngsters. Ads today tend to focus on the individual rather than on family. Uh, New York, more than 700 couples a week. Some middle-aged pay, uh, pay to visit a club where they, can exchange, where they can engage in sex with any willing party they happen to meet, says one participant, a divorced executive. I'm only seeking my own pleasure and satisfying my needs. And this, you know, this, this phrase, my need, has come to be the catchword of, of society, and everybody's concerned about fulfilling his need. And it is a self-oriented society. The discotheque on, owner in Washington sums up the prevailing philosophy of such activities in simple terms. People are into having a good time. You know, that's what people are into right now. All right, well, there, I, I'm not going to go on and read a whole lot of that. Another article was in U.S. News just a few weeks ago. Um, Question, do you think the so-called me society leads to more broken marriages? Yes, I believe the me philosophy is contributing to the high divorce rate we have now. This is uh, from uh, Dr. Robert B. Taylor, a specialist in family medicine who was interviewed in U.S. News and World Report. Uh, The problem goes back to the child-rearing principles which were in effect from the mid-40s to the mid-60s. This was considered to be the age of permissiveness. When wants became needs and parents failed to teach their children how to deal with frustration. You know, there's a difference between what we want and what we need. 
And we need to understand that difference. And during the age of permissiveness, children were not taught the difference between want and needs, and so now everybody thinks that he needs everything to his liking, to his specifications. This was a result of the age of permissiveness. Parents fail to teach their children how to deal with frustration. You don't always get everything you want. I'm not trying to be hard-nosed when I say that. That's just the fact. Just the fact. That's the way life is. We don't always get everything we want. In fact, we never get everything we want. It just works that way. So parents fail to teach their children how to deal with frustration. They fail to teach them a sense of commitment to relationship and to, to relationships and to others. Many of the people in this group are now young adults in the early years of marriage when they are the most vulnerable to divorce. Another factor is that we're living in the age of disposability. Use it up once, and you use it once and throw it away. You know, no return, no deposit society. Over the past decade, there has developed a feeling that relationships are equally disposable. Divorce has unfortunately gained social acceptance. He goes on talking about some of it. But he focuses in on the fact of the me generation. And certainly, brethren, we need to understand this. I want to, I want to spend a little bit of time on it because the preoccupation of our society is self-indulgent. Now, God prophesied of this, inspired the Apostle Paul to write in 2 Timothy chapter, chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce makers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. Verse 5, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, denying the authority of God's way of life. You know, you are clinging, clinging, clinging to religion. But is the Methodists now have a divorce ceremony they go through in church, you know, where they have the blessing of the divorce, just like they have the, uh, you know, the blessing of the marriage. You know, abominable in the sight of God. God says, I hate that. You go back and you read some of the punishments God says is going to come on the false ministry of this world. Or their abominable teachings on every imaginable subject. God says, perilous times will come in the last days, and the first thing he lists to categorize the end generation is men shall be lovers of their own selves. God lifts the me generation, the excessive preoccupation with self as the first descriptive phrase of the last generation. God describes that in the context of being perilous times that are coming. Because it is perilous times. It threatens the destruction of the family unit. And the destruction of the family unit threatens the destruction of all mankind. And the commission of this era of the church is to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. God says, let I come and smite the earth with utter destruction. The family unit pictures the relationship that we have and can have with God. God, uh, the family relationship is... Uh, uh, a type of the kingdom of God pictures the relationship of Christ and the church. And Satan hates the family relationship. He hates the fact of what man can be and what he can never be. And as a result, he has an all-out attack to destroy the family relationship. A lot of the problems that come are coming to the fore in, in recent years has been because of the increase of an excessive preoccupation with self that is the tenor of our society. And brethren, we have to realize that, that a lot of the attitudes and a lot of the concepts of society gradually begin to rub off on us and we're not even conscious of the fact we're absorbing. But we began to change in our attitude, in our outlook, in our acceptance of things that God condemned. And we gradually come to the point where we're not bothered by some of these things anymore. Things have crept into the church of God that would have added, if, if, if there are those, you know, who, who died 15 years ago that could suddenly be resurrected, they would be so shocked and appalled at some of the things that, that you know, that have transpired. You know, 
what do you think? Mrs. Herbert Armstrong died 12 years ago. You know, she could have been resurrected, particularly, I have a particular reference to before things began to turn around, but, uh, you know, we haven't solved all the results of things. I'll guarantee you she would have been uh, quite uh, shocked by, I think what would have maybe been the most shocking is the acceptance that certain things had seemingly found in the minds of many people in God's church who really, you know, we, we've, we've known better, but we have to keep constantly in mind the fact that Satan is continually bombarded. And we're living in this society, we, we're a, we, we have to be in it, even though we're not to be of it, but that is very difficult to be in something and yet not of it. And the values of society rub off on us. And it comes, it sneaks up on us gradually. We don't realize what changes we're making in our attitudes and our outlook. And gradually we begin to drift off course. And it happens and it comes on suddenly. It's not something we intend to do. It's not because we're not part, we don't, uh, you know, we'll say, well, I just don't want to obey God anymore. That's, that's not the problem in most cases. It's the fact that we gradually drift off because of the bombardment of society and not really uh, seeing things from God's perspective. And so we have to keep going back, you know, and analyzing the trends of the society with the pages of the Bible and to realize God's standards don't change. God's laws don't change. You know, God says, I change not. It says that right in the book of Malachi. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13, 8. So God doesn't change with the times. Now, there are, there are many other things that I wanted to get into, and I see that I'm not going to have time. I'm going to continue this at a later date, because this is a subject. In, in the sermons on the, na- uh, on the relationship of, of the family, on husbands and wives, and there are many aspects of it to go into, are things that I think we need a particular emphasis on in the Church of God today, because the emphasis of society has been so corrupting and so, uh, and so false from the standpoint of God's Word. Let's notice a little bit back in the book of uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the Word, they may without the Word be won by the conduct of the wives. So it tells, you know, here addressing wives who have unconverted husbands, the way to, to win them is not to try to talk religion to them. You know, if you're in the church and your husband is not, don't try to talk religion to it. Don't try to explain things out of the Bible to him. Now, you know, if he really wants to know or something, he can answer his question or, or suggest literature. But so many times we want them to want to, to know, and we keep trying to push it at. And all it does is cause problems. You know, you win them by your conduct. While they behold your chaste conduct coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be the outward adorning of plaiting of hair and of wearing of gold or putting on of apparel, let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. And that's something, this talks about the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit in the sight of God of great price. Now that is not society's ideal for women. Well, that, that's not, uh, it's not describing Bella Abzug here. You know, the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. That's not, that's not the, the, uh, the typical women's liberty. That's not what God holds out as an example. After this manner, in the old time, the holy women also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjections unto their own husbands. Boy, this flies in the face of our modern uh, equality and everything. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, as long as you do well and are not afraid with any amazement, likewise you husbands. Dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, as being heirs together of the grace of life, if your prayers be not hindered. Finally, be you all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful or full of pity or, or, or tenderness, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but counterwise blessing, knowing that you are there unto call that you should inherit a blessing. So, uh, it talks about here being uh, the relationship of husbands and wives. Now, I want to focus in on, on verse 7 a little bit. 
Husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. You're having marital problems that's interfering with your spiritual life. Now, that's what God says. You want your prayers bouncing off the ceiling, not, not rising any higher than your voice? you're not dwelling with your wife according to knowledge, if you're not doing what God says here, uh, then you're just bouncing it off the ceiling. Your prayers are being hindered. So what that says, husbands and wives, is if you've got problems, you better get them ironed out because it will destroy you spiritually if you don't. It will destroy you spiritually if you don't. So if you've got problems, you better iron them out. You better seek counsel. You better study the Scriptures. And certainly, you know, that's why God has placed the ministry in the church. For the edifying, the building up of the body of Christ. For the work of the ministry. For the perfecting of the saints. That's why God has placed the ministry here. That's why I'm here. That's why uh, the elders are here in this congregation. To serve you. Through our counsel. Uh, through our advice. Through our correction. Through our admonition. Through our encouragement to work with you and to help you and to serve you. You know, avail yourselves of that counsel if you're having problems of this nature. Because I am telling you on the authority of God's Word, it will destroy you spiritually if you let it coast on. It really will. Now, how many times are we as husbands really dwelling with our wives according to knowledge? Most many times we don't even barely get to know our wives in the sense of, in the ongoing sense. You know, maybe we knew each other once and as, as we go on, how much, you can't know someone unless you spend time with them, communicate, unless you're aware of their feelings and their frustrations. I have a book I'd like to recommend, and uh, I've only got one copy of it. I've, I've loaned it out uh, to, I don't know how many people, but I'm sure it's available at the public library. And I would, in bookstores, I would very highly recommend it. It would be good for husbands and wives both. I think particularly uh, I'd recommend this to husbands, but I think it would also be good for wives to read. It's by Dr. James Dobson. He's written several very good books. Uh, he wrote uh, Dare to Discipline, and he wrote uh, Hide or Seek. This particular one is What Wives Wish Their Husbands Knew About Women. What Wives Wish Their Husbands Knew About Women by Dr. James Dobson. And he goes through a number of things in his book that are right, that are correct. I'm not, you know, I don't endorse any books 100% except for the Bible. But I'll tell you, the principles he brings out in there are biblical. And he applies many biblical principles. And his experience, and he goes through talking about many of the problems and the frustrations that women deal with. And he bases this on thousands of women that he counsels with. And I'll guarantee you, based on my experience, I would rate I would rate it exactly the same way he does. I've seen it just by way of experience. Just you know, you, you counsel with with uh, dozens and scores of, of women over a period of years, you know, and you at least begin to understand what some of them feel like, some of their frustrations are. And he certainly uh, counseled even with thousands of, uh, of women, but I know his experience was, was uh, very much what I would have felt. And, and I I know my wife read the book, and she certainly agreed with it and felt like that uh, he uh, was very accurate in his analysis. So I, you know, I wanted her advice, I wanted her input on it, and that she felt like he was accurate, and she certainly did, and I think many other women that have read the book have felt the same way. But, you know, husbands need to dwell, dwell with your wives according to knowledge. I'll just mention a couple of things. One the number one problem for women that Dobson came up with out of his analysis and questionnaires that were passed out to thousands of women was the problem of low self-esteem. Well, that's why so many women, well, let's put it this way. If women felt genuinely respected in their roles as wives and mothers, they would not need to abandon them for something better, quote, unquote. Women's live movement and many of these things have, have been directed. And society as a whole has kind of uh, demeaned the importance and the vital function that the wife and mother plays in society. And it is a vital function. 
It is vital to keeping the family family centered and home centered. And when you do away with that, you are actually doing away with the family in the long run. But it's a problem. The, I think particularly for women with small children, fatigue and time pressure is a very uh, strong problem. I, I think he rated it number two. Going on beyond that to other problems like loneliness, isolation, boredom, the absence of romantic love. You know, I've named off a few, and I, I don't have time to go into detail. Uh, you know, might serve as a good conversation points, place to start. Husbands and wives maybe talk about some of these things. Now, wives, you know, you're given some instruction here too. You're told to submit yourselves, to be in subjection to your husband. Not to try to lord it over them, not to try to dominate them, not to try to wear the pants in the family. Don't set out to, you know, on a remake hubby project. A lot of people feel like, well, they'll get married, and then after they get married, they'll change all the things in the other one they don't like. That's a very faulty reason. Very faulty reason. It won't work. That's why it's faulty. Uh, there's only one person on the face of the earth you can change. You know who that is? You. That's not easy, is it? If you've ever tried on yourself, it's not easy. It's a lot harder on someone else. In fact, it just can't be done. So, when you set out to remake your husband or your wife, you're just asking for trouble. Um, down in Proverbs chapter 19, in verse in 13, it says, A foolish son is the calamity of his father, and the contentions of a wife are a continual dropping, or like a, a dripping a dripping faucet. You know, to use a modern analogy, uh, don't nag. That's the point of it. You know, that's not the way to get things done. Don't nag. They don't, uh, you know, don't argue and harangue and, and, you know, set your will to have your own way. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, be submissive to your husband. You know, go through and study... God's Word, and and let's understand, God gives us an instruction book here. Society is grasping around for answers to its problems. And they look to every source except the right one. They look to every source except the source, the revealed Word of God. It tells us what we're to do and how we're to live our lives. It gives us the keys. Brethren, in God's church, We have this knowledge. We have this book available to us. We have the answers right here. That's why it is such, I think, a a terrible tragedy for a couple, both converted, both in God's church, to be having serious marital problems because it doesn't have to be that way. The answers are available. But you've got to apply them. You've got to work at it. And you, frankly, have got to go through and search them out and understand what they are. I want to continue with this subject at a later time because uh, uh, we're out of time this afternoon, but it is something that needs a lot of emphasis and that we need to, to go into and to understand. But I, I just I want to, to focus on the fact that marriage is a divine institution that God gave and God intended it to be happy. A happy home life is the greatest of physical blessings. Really is, brethren, and of all the people on earth, we ought to have happy marriages. We've got the keys to them right here. We have the keys available. But it's our responsibility to take those keys, to search them out, and to apply them in our own lives.